Welcome to this lecture for the Herschel Society and the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. I'm Tony Symes. I organise monthly lectures for the Herschel Society. Uh, the title is The Astrophysics of Earth, Light Life Interactions Beyond Photosynthesis. And the lecturer is Bob Fosbury. Now, where this lecture fits in is with uh, Bath Preservation Trust, who are doing conservation in action this year, and the Herschel Museum of Astronomy, which is focused on conserving the planet as part of the BPT uh, theme. The Herschel Society are collaborating with this on a series of four lectures given from September to December this year. And we started last month with The Right Light at Night with Steve Tonkin, in which we learned a lot about uh, the wrong kind of light, uh, too much light, and uh, LED lighting that has far too much in the blue spectrum, which does a lot of damage to uh, our health and animal life. Uh, the next lecture in the series after this one uh, is going to be about uh, satellite constella constellations and why they get in the way of uh, observing the night sky. And then finally, uh, in December, uh, it's going to be about space debris. Uh, we also have coming up uh, another lecture, which is at Bath University. This is the Caroline Herschel Prize Lecture, which is given by a young female astronomer who has won uh, a competition for this. She gets a prize and she has to give us uh, a lecture that will be at the university and it will be free if you register. Uh, I can't give you, it's on the 16th of November, but further details will be on our website shortly. Back to tonight's lecture, we are very fortunate that Bob Fosbury has settled in Bath and has given us several outstanding talks over the recent years. The last one being the memorable, How the Sun Paints the Sky. Light will also be at the center of this talk. But first, about Bob Fosbury, he's currently an emeritus astronomer at the European Southern Observatory and an honorary professor at the Institute of Ophthalmology at UCL. In the past, he's worked for ESA in collaboration with NASA on the Hubble Space Telescope and served on NASA's ad hoc science working group and ESA's study science team developing instrument concepts for the James Webb Space Telescope. Also uh, taking part in this lecture will be Glenn Jeffrey, who is Professor of Visual ne Neuroscience at uh, UCL and has been collaborating with Bob Fosbury. Let me hand over to Bob. Well, thank you very much, Tony, for that. Uh, am I audible to everyone, even Paul? <laughs> very good. OK. Um, you're probably wondering what this lecture is about. And I, I should just say right at the beginning that it does have something to do with light pollution, although I won't mention very much about light pollution in the sense that this pro provides the sort of overview of the interactions of l light with the whole biosphere in a sense that implies what we're doing wrong with lighting on the planet at the moment and what we have to do to get it right. So there's a, there is a direct connection with uh, light pollution, but I won't be talking about the details of light pollution itself. This is much more a very general picture of the way light interacts with life. And I don't mean just humans, I mean really the whole biosphere. And uh, before I, I, I'll do two things before I start on the lecture proper. One, one, one thing I'll do, I'll give you a brief glossary of terms I will use to try and uh, make it easier to understand some of the concepts I'll talk about. And the other, I'll give you a slightly, uh, hopefully entertaining picture of what our light environment, our natural light environment is like, which may surprise you. Uh, and that's all just fun in the beginning. So relax and you don't have to learn anything yet, except remember what uh, uh, the glossary is. Well, very simple, I I'll be talking about light and because we're talking about biochemistry and light interacting. 
it's the photon which is important. It's not the energy from the light so much. It's the fact that a photon interacts with a biomolecule and changes the state of the biomolecule. So we talk in terms of photons rather than power or watts per square meter for whatever. It's photon flux. It's the rate of solar photons coming to the, to the ground, which are important for us. Photosynthesis is probably the, you know, the best known uh, process. It should be the best known process in, on the planet because essentially all of our energy comes from photosynthesis. All of our food, uh, the stored coal and oil under the ground and so on, it all derives from the energy from solar photons. Now there are other energy sources on the earth used in weird places where there's no light and uh, probably no oxygen as well. So I can't say all the life on, on the planet is driven by photosynthesis, uh, but essentially all, all, all of life. And that's basically a process that converts the photon energy. So we're actually taking energy from the sun and we're putting it through this process and we're getting energy out the other end. But the energy out at the other end is chemical energy. It's like carbohydrates or sugars, which we can all eat and also can be stored as coal and oil. Um, it does this amazingly using water and carbon dioxide uh, and very little else. And I, I, I remember the famous statement by the physicist C.V. Raman, a very famous Nobel laureate in, 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 in physics from India. He was the first Indian Nobel laureate. He used to say, plants crystallize out of the air. And in fact, that's exactly what they do. Photosynthesis makes these carbohydrates, but it also releases oxygen as a waste product. Before photosynthesis, there wasn't any oxygen in the atmosphere. So it, it does two things. It, ma it makes our food and it makes oxygen. And we, as life on the planet, have signed a sort of Faustian contract with, uh, with oxygen and light because oxygen uh, killed everything on the planet at the time. It was highly toxic. It's still highly toxic. We've evolved a way of living with oxygen. And the advantage is we get all this energy. We can generate energy very quickly, more quickly than photosynthesis can, uh, but it will also kill us in the end. Oxygen will kill you in the end. Uh, so it is a fast uh, pack. But we have a good time while we're, while we're living, but uh, that's the end of it. Um, there are two physical interactions of light with matter, which I want to make clear. Uh, they're actually quite easy to understand. Scattering is the bouncing of photons off things. Uh, there are things that scatter, that interact with light and scatter them off. And the, the light that's scattered off is exactly the same color and energy as the light that came on. So it's like a, it's like billiard balls co colliding in a sense, without any loss or uh, acquisition of energy. And uh, the obstructions in biology are parts of your cell structures, uh, various uh, structures, fine structures in your body, which have slight refractive index variations between them. And those will scatter light, especially infrared light, around the body. And we'll, we'll talk about that. It's a very important part of the talk. Um, the other process is absorption, capturing, capturing, in fact, ingesting photons as energy in another form. So a molecule, uh, a surface, uh, the atoms on a surface can absorb light. It just takes the photon away. It converts it into, into energy, usually heat. Uh, so the scattering and absorption are very important in the atmosphere, and they're very important in the body, and they do different things. And we'll be talking about that a bit in a bit. Now, the, the two parts of cells which are of most interest to us in this talk are, we're not talking about plants so much, but the chloroplast, this is the organelle inside the plant cell, which contains the chlorophyll and contains the mechanism which actually does this conversion of light energy to chemical energy. And it makes the sugars. So that's very important. And it's very similar in origin and in general structure to the mitochondrion. Now, the mitochondrion is the sort of counterpart in animal life that takes the food ingested from the photosynthetic process and burns it with oxygen uh, to make chemical energy, which the cells can use. Um, so that's uh, those are the sort of basic elements of the talk that I thought I should explain before we move on. Now, this is an introduction to our natural light environment. And in fact, we're not very familiar with our natural light environment because very few of us can see it anymore. We're not privileged enough to see it. So we have to go to very special places to see this. Uh, but I'll run through it all just to give you a, an idea of the scope and range of what, we, uh, what is accessible to us. 
So we do have to go to very special places. We have very special places. One of them, which is probably the most special, or one of the most special, is the northern Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, we have an observatory called the Paranal Observatory, run by the European Southern Observatory. Uh, the telescopes uh, on the top of the uh, on the top of the hill here uh, are at about two thousand five hundred meters, not terribly high. Um, uh, we see light from the sky in daylight and also reflected from our surroundings. And that's another important concept we'll come to, the reflection from our surroundings. Now, our eyes are amazing devices. They can capture a huge range in brightness. From full sunlight, uh, we can go down a factor of a billion uh, to the darkest night sky. And once we've dark adapted, we can see that as well. So our eyes are remarkable uh, devices. So we'll, we'll first of all go to... Um, this is our Paranal Observatory. This is actually looking uh, out towards the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and this is another view of the Pacific Ocean from the observatory at twilight, where you can see the sharp line across there. It's actually the Pacific, but it has a layer of cloud over it, which is usually there. It's a cold current. And there's an inversion layer lower than the observatory. So all the cloud is trapped below the observatory. So it's a very, very clear sight. So we've gone down by a factor of about 10,000 in brightness between the first picture and this one. Now, if we go to real night, uh, it's, um, it's pretty dark. So really, you can't see very much. Um, but if you wait about 40 minutes, um, your eyes will adapt and you will start to see things. I'll speed it up for you a bit here. So I'll just set it off. This is your dark adaption working. And gradually, you see the night sky appearing. So this is a factor of a billion fainter than the first picture. And uh, it's quite remarkable. You'll recognize the Milky Way. It looks bent because this is a wide angle panorama. The galactic center is down off to the left. So this is the outer part of the galaxy you're seeing. And you're seeing stars and galaxies. You might recognize Orion on its side, so just to the right of that, of that dark band. And the two Magellanic clouds uh, above, the, above the mountain, the, our, our nearest galaxies. You'll also see a curious white glow uh, which we call the air glow. And if I actually now do it with a digital camera and show the, uh, the colors, uh, you can see uh, a, green, a greenish glow close to the horizon and a reddish glow above the horizon. This is the same emission mechanism as you see in the aurora, but the excitation mechanism, the mechanism that actually makes the stored energy in the day is different. It's, it's sunlight interacting with the upper atmosphere, storing energy. And then in the nighttime, it, you gradually lose the energy by recombining oxygen atoms and letting the oxygen atoms glow. Now, I only thought of this the other day, I must say, to, but, it, but it's a stunning thought that that air glow in the sky is the signature of life. The only reason we see that beautiful air glow in the sky is be because we have photosynthesis and we make oxygen and fill the atmosphere with oxygen. So if we didn't have any life, you wouldn't see the air glow. Interesting thought. OK, so we've gone down by a factor of a million. How far can we go? This is as far as we can go with our eyes. Uh, but if we, if we took the faintest star we could see with our naked eye here and asked the question, how much fainter can we go with our instrumentation, like space telescopes and so on now? And uh, the next slide is a, a deep image taken with the new James Webb Space Telescope which goes very, very deep, uh, very faint objects. The, the curious objects there with the crosses coming out, these are stars in our galaxy, but they're probably only about five or six stars in our galaxy in this picture, all of the rest of very distant galaxies. And uh, well, I won't talk about that, but the point is that now we've gone down another 10 billion. So from the first picture to the faintest object humans can see with the big telescopes, we're down 10 billion billion in brightness. So this is the night environment we're, uh, we're, that's given to us, and we can see one of the reasons we're suffering is looking at the Earth now, where we're polluting everything. And most of this light is completely unnecessary. I won't evangelize about that, but uh, I mean, it's completely unnecessary, and it's absolutely the wrong light to use on life, as we'll, as we'll see. And just to give you a, a little idea of what the components of the natural uh, light are, I've got this diagram here where... Um, You'll see brightness 
on, on the left hand scale. That's a logarithmic scale. So every every tick mark on there is a factor of 10. So that's 10 to the 10. And you can see that what we can see fits into 10 to the 10 to the nine, uh, a billion. And so we have sunlight and, and sort of clear daylight, clear sky daylight in the shade at the top. The top range in, during during daylight with the sun above the horizon uh, ranges over a factor of a few thousand in, in brightness. When we get into twilight, and I've marked civil twilight, bright twilight, where you can see relatively easily, and that's where the law kicks in, telling you to put car lights on and things like that. Nautical twilight, where sailors can still see the horizon, and then astronomical twilight, where it starts getting seriously dark. Remarkably, the change in brightness as you go down in degrees of altitude below the horizon, the, on the, the scale on the bottom there, minus six degrees, minus 12, minus 18, Zero to minus six is civil twilight, six to minus 12 is nautical and so on. And the, the twilight actually follows a very strict, easy mathematical law down to the beginning of astronomical twilight. And the curl up in the end with those crosses is the fact that you're seeing starlight in the galaxy and you're seeing air glow and you're seeing light scattered from dust in the solar system and so on. So the actual twilight process is a linear process over five orders of magnitude, which is remarkable, I think. These are all my measurements, by the way, except the ones, the crosses on the bottom, which come from Paranal. So in case we don't get to the end, um, uh, let me, oh yes, thought about that. That's what light pollution does. It wipes out the bottom half of this diagram, so we can't see it. I ask you, how many, how many people have seen the Milky Way with the naked eye? So most, most of you, okay. How many people have seen the Milky Way this year? Three. Okay. Well, it tells a story, doesn't it? So really the bottom lines. Um, sunlight powers the Earth. We've, we've, we've taken that as our starting point. Uh, life has evolved to use this light in many, and it turns out subtle ways, even with colors that fall well beyond just those that we can see with our eyes. And this is really important. And we haven't quite realized all of this yet. Animal bodies are highly adapted light harvesting machines. Now, this may come as a surprise to you. It came as a surprise to us, but it is really quite remarkable. And uh, I'll illustrate this. We've made radical changes to artificial lighting over the last decades. I, when you stop using your trusty tungsten filament electric Edison light bulbs and started using fluorescent tubes, the rot had already set in. By the time you got to white LEDs, rot had, the, 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 the deadly rot had started. So we, we've, we've, changed, we've changed the lighting in a way that hasn't been changed before during the last four billion years, as far as animals and, and life is concerned. Now, we didn't realize that at the time. Perhaps we should have done. We didn't realize that at the time. But it is a disaster. It is a disaster in ways which I'll describe. It's being realized that these changes resulting from the lighting, which most of us spend most of our time in, most of us spend most of our time indoors or something like that under LED lights, and we don't go out into the sunlight often enough. It's being realized these changes resulting in profoundly negative con consequences for the health of the biosphere. So what do we know? Well, we know plants, including algae and cyanobacteria in the oceans and so on, use solar photons, water and carbon dioxide to make chemical energy in the form of carbohydrates, food, coal, oil. The process has been understood or has been known since 1779 when oxygen was observed coming off plants in sunlight. Uh, but it's taken two and a half centuries to figure out what's going on. And we still don't know it. In, we still don't know exactly what's going on. There are very subtle physical processes going on. It was, it was largely the understanding of the physics at the end over the last uh, 30, uh, 30, 40, 50 years that transform the understanding of photosynthesis because they're very complex quantum reactions in, in, in biomolecules. Life uses these sugars to build bodies and provide useful energy. When I say useful energy, this is the kind of energy that you can use to move around. It's the kind of energy you can use to think, uh, and it's the kind of energy you can use for vision and so on. These are things that do real things. Otherwise, the photons would just degrade into heat and be useless. And, you know, it's a fundamental evolutionary 
understanding that evolution will always try and find the ways of making best use of resources. And if you have a resources of photons coming from the sun, you will use the, all of those photons that are accessible on the ground to best effect. And so far, we've only got as far as the ultraviolet and the visible, and we haven't really thought about the infrared. That's what we're doing now. The other thing which is uh, rather remarkable, uh, and that's the particular optical properties of water are so crucial for life. Now, we kind of know that, but when I, I'm, I'm showing you a diagram at the moment, which you, I know Glenn, my collaborator, had not seen until a few months ago. When I showed it to him, his mouth dropped open. He didn't realize what, <laughs> what, it, what it actually meant. But this is uh, a diagram which um, oh, I, I'm looking at my screen here, and it shows the slide coming next rather than the slide I'm on. So sorry, I'll have to wait a moment. We, we need to figure out how sunlight reaches the biosphere. So light from the sun has to pass through the atmosphere. And there's an advert uh, um, for my talk last uh, last Herschel site meeting. That talk is on the, the text of that talk is on the Herschel website. The damaging UV light uh, is absorbed by ozone gas, but near ultraviolet visible and much of the infrared light gets through either as direct sunlight from the sun or indirectly via the sky and our surroundings. And there, there is a remarkable congruence between the transmitted light and the absorption properties of water. And uh, you can see that here. Uh, the blue line here is the power of absorption of the water. And you can see the scale that on, the, on the left there is a factor of, I can't remember how many it is, but it's a lot. It's uh, more than a billion. So water is pretty transparent, long wavelength radio radiation. This is what they use to communicate with nuclear submarines under the water. But as soon as you get into radio, the, the broadcast radio bands, the satellite bands, uh, submillimeter telephone communications and so on, and the infrared, it's extremely absorbent. So water will not penetrate into your body. Uh, the light will not penetrate into the water of your body, in your body very far. Um, but in the, in the visible spectrum there, water is incredibly transparent. So water is clear, you know, you could see a long way down <laughs> into, into the sea. And the, the converse, the, the, the red line there is the transmission. So the transmission of one in the middle there is where the light, the light is completely transparent. So you can see it extends through the visible spectrum and it starts dropping, the transmission starts dropping as you get into the infrared. And we're, we're concerned about the region between the, the visible red and, and the part of the spectrum where the water starts seriously absorbing. So there's a gap there, and I'll explain what that gap actually means. So let's just focus for a moment on the light that comes down from the sun through the atmosphere. The gray line there is the spectrum of the sun, spectrum being the, the brightness on the, on the vertical axis and the wavelength or color. I, I, I usually put a color figure on there, a color, uh, uh, um, logo on there to show you what the colors are, but the visible is over to the left, the infrared is over to the right there. So the sunlight coming down to the ground gets predominantly scattered to make the blue sky in the visible spectrum, uh, but in the, in, the, in the infrared spectrum it starts absorbing, and the, the red lines there are water bands in the, in, in the atmosphere. This is water in the atmosphere, water vapor in the atmosphere, absorbing the light coming down. So this is, what, this is what it looks like in terms of power, that is watts per square meter per unit wavelength. Now, I, I said in the beginning, we're dealing with biology, and biology requires that you deal with photons. So I've got exactly the same plot, but it's in photons rather than power. And you see the whole thing is shifted over to the right towards the infrared. And the consequence of that is, although the, almost all the, most of the power in sunlight is in the visible spectrum, you go outside and you feel the heat and most of that heat is coming from the visible part of the spectrum. There's some coming from the infrared, but there's not so much. If you count the photons instead of the power, most of the photons come in the infrared. So as far as interaction of, between photons and biology is concerned, the infrared is extremely important. And uh, so we work in terms of photon flux, photons per second per square meter or whatever, uh, rather than power. So when you feel this infrared that I'm talking about, you don't really feel it as heat. There's much too little of it to feel as heat. It's the photons that are doing the work. And this is just another, uh, it's a, a, a logarithmic scale on the left, just to show you what the absorbers are. 
predominantly water, you can see the water, the main water bands in there, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, a few weird ox oxygen transitions that I won't talk about. But basically the, the visible spectrum is fairly clear of absorption and all the twilight colors and so on, it's all due to scattering. Very little of that has anything to do with absorption. So yes, coming back to try and help you a bit with basic physics for those who don't, I know there are some in the audience who know this very well, but uh, I, I'm drawing a distinction between the behavior of different kinds of light, ultraviolet light, visible light, and near infrared light. Now the UV light is special because it breaks things. UV light can break atoms, it can knock electrons off atoms, it can ionize atoms, it can break molecular bonds, uh, it can damage DNA, breaking the DNA molecule, so it can, it can mutate your DNA. But it also has one positive thing, it can make vitamin D, and vitamin D is produced by breaking a bond in cholesterol, which is in, on the surface of your skin, and converting that into a, a molecule which becomes vitamin D. So it does have its uses. Now, visible light contains predominantly what we call electron transitions in atoms and molecules. This is where the light has sufficient energy to move an electron to another energy state in the atom or molecule. And because it moves, uh, because it's absorbing visible light to do that, it becomes colored. So visible, the visible light region is the region where we see pigments all the brilliant colors that you see in the, in the plants and the animals are because you're moving electrons around in atoms or molecules and absorbing some light and leaving other light coming through. So the visible light is the land of, uh, of, of pigments and colors. Interestingly, when you move into the infrared, you don't have enough energy to move electrons around in atoms, and uh, it means you don't really have pigments. So if you could see in the infrared, you wouldn't actually see bright colors. You wouldn't see many colors. You may see sort of faint colors and so on. It, when, when we make astronomical pictures in the, in the infrared, we have to work quite hard to make colors <laughs> to put in them. We can, but... Uh, um, so what infrared light does, instead of moving an electron, it, it can interact with a molecule and ring it like a bell. So you, you, you induce a vibration in a molecule, which actually moves it to a different quantum state. That's sort of called, called a vibrational excitation. And when you, when you interact with a molecule in that way, you can actually make the molecule behave slightly differently. And we think this is the key to the, to the biochemical processes we're seeing. The, inter, the infrared light interacts with the important absorbing molecules in the infrared. It changes their state a little bit and perhaps tips them over the cliff. I saw a wonderful phrase, that, that, that is a kinetically inhibited transition. Uh, it's a transition that can almost take place that can't quite get there, doesn't quite get up the top there. And one of these infrared photons can come in, vibrate it a little bit, push it over the edge. So that's probably an important mechanism we'll deal with. But the, the other point is that these, these vibrational transitions are much, much weaker than the optical transitions. So you can get further through the material before you get absorbed. Now I'm going to dwell on these spectra for a moment because it's actually quite important to understand what's going on here. This again is the sunlight outside the atmosphere in the dark gray and the blue is the actually a model of the light coming down to the surface when the sun is about 30 degrees above the horizon and you can see the water absorptions and so on. But I want to you to cast your eye on those dashed lines there. There are two lamps. One is a white LED and the other is an old tungsten filament bulb. Okay. So the tungsten filament is the red dash line and the LED is the green dash line. Now you'll see that I've matched them in the, in the yellow green part of the spectrum, uh, about five, between 500 and 600 nanometers. So there's roughly the same brightness when, when you look at them with your eye. But as you move into the infrared, you see the LED drops to zero and the old tungsten filament goes up to infinity almost and the sun falls somewhere in the middle. So what's happened with these LEDs, they produce light you can see, but they produce nothing in the infrared. So the ratio uh, between the old lamps and the new lamps is infinity, which is not good news for biology. So um, I just run through the, the, the main processes, the main biological processes that are occurring. You see vitamin D is done in the ultraviolet and you'll see um, 
300 nanometers there, you'll see the, there's almost no energy left from the sun. And that's where we make vitamin D. And at 30 degrees altitude, the sun won't make vitamin D. It has to be higher. This is why you only get your vitamin D in the summer. Uh, and so, so it's a very critical region. But if you get sun in the summer, you can make plenty of vitamin D, no problem. Uh, in the winter, you have to be more careful. Um, the next major thing we've talked about is photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis exploits the visible spectrum. Uh, you can see that it's, it, it absorbs strongly in the blue. It absorbs strongly in the red. But all the actual mechanisms happen in the red. The red is where the work actually gets done. The blue actually finds a way of getting some of its energy into the red and, uh, and contributes. But the, the main photosynthetic work happens in, in the red. And finally, we move on to the other region, uh, which I call the tissue transparency window. Now, you'll see, first of all, the tissue transparency window contains more real estate than all the others. Uh, this is the infrared before you really run into very serious water absorption. And this, this is the place where you don't get strong pigments and tissue is relatively transparent. So photons can get into the tissue and they can bounce around for a long time before they get absorbed by a molecule which has a weak absorber. And this transforms uh, the way light interacts. The infrared light interacts in your body in ways that you would never have dreamt. So this tissue transparency window, interestingly, the infrared was discovered by William Herschel in 1800, which is, uh, forms a strong connection with the place of this talk. Um, it's, it's a very important region and very many medics and medical researchers now are realizing that lots of things happen in this window, which are very important for uh, medical processes. Uh, that's just showing them all together. And I, I, I only put that red line in as a marker because it'll appear in some other slides. There's a kind of magic about that particular color in that it's of importance both for animals and for plants. And we're not sure exactly what's going on, but a lot of the experimental work, which uh, Glenn has been working on over the last years, has been at this wavelength and it does amazing things. Uh, and we're still not sure exactly what it does. There's plenty of unknowns in this, I have to say. Now, in order to explain actually how this, um, what's special about this transparency window? How does, it, how does it alter the way things really work compared to what happens in the, in the visible? And I use a, a well-known uh, analogy. Uh, I didn't spell it out for legal reasons, but I, I, I suspect nobody will have any trouble realizing what I'm saying. Has anyone has never been into an IKEA store? No, I thought so. Well, you know what happens when you go into, like walking away from the microphone, it doesn't matter. You know what happens when you go to an IKEA store? You walk up a set of steps, perhaps, and you walk along. Uh, and you know this, this is a strategy uh, to make sure that everybody goes to um, uh, to all the desks and buys things that they didn't want to buy. Um, it's a bit the same with light. When light goes into your body, it, it will penetrate maybe a couple of millimeters into the body. This is infrared light. Uh, if it's blue light, it'll penetrate a tiny distance. Uh, if it's ultraviolet light, even tinier distance. But infrared light will travel a few millimeters into your body. It'll then bounce off a cell wall or a mitochondrion or something, and it'll move on, and it'll do a random walk. And random walks go all over the place. You know, each random walk is roughly the same length. It's called the photon mean-free path. Uh, it's roughly the same length, uh, but it can scatter many, many times, and it ends up some way from where it started. And there's a mathematical uh, uh, approximation which tells you the distance that it moves is the photon mean free path times the square root of the number of scatterings that it's uh, that it suffered. So it does move on, but it moves on very slowly. So uh, if we look at that process now, you see a, a photon coming down from the sun at the top, enters the skin, it bounces off, and it follows this uh, random scattering process. And eventually it might find a molecule which has a weak absorber in it and it gets absorbed by the molecule. Meanwhile, it may have traveled centimeters into your body. So this is a way of getting light into the body. 
And in fact, it's, it's, it, it is a kind of light trap because the, the photons coming down from the sun, you will have so many photons in a, in a cubic meter of space just above your skin. It's about, it's about a billion. No, sorry, it's about 10 million photons in a, in a, at any one time in a, in a cubic centimeter of, of space just in front of your skin. When those photons enter the skin, they start bouncing around for maybe 10, 20 times longer than it will take for that light to get straight through your body. And so the photon density in the body builds up and it's much brighter. If you were sitting in your body a few centimeters beneath the skin, you see an incredibly bright haze of infrared radiation all around you. And these are all the photons that have been scattered in, and they're much brighter than they are outside the body because they've been delayed. So it's a light trap. It delays the light until either it gets out at the other side, some of it gets reflected out straight away, of course, about half of it gets reflected straight back in, into the air. But the, the, the rest of the light bounces around inside, and the, the numbers build up until the, the losses, the absorbance, the, the absorbance of the photons um, uh, 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 balances the, uh, the photons coming in and you, you, know, you have an equilibrium. But the photon density inside the body is very high and it means these photons can wander around and they can find all the weak absorbers. They can get absorbed and do useful biology. So it's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary process. And I can demonstrate this by taking a picture of my hand. You've seen this on the poster. Uh, this is a slightly different version. But this is a picture of my hand looking at the back of my hand and there's an 850 nanometer uh, led behind the uh, behind my hand and the light scattering all through my hand it looks like when it comes out the other side it looks like a you know frosted screen or something the light's coming from all directions and you can't see any details on the front surface the only reason you see the veins is the veins are on the on the surface of your of your hand at the top now if i turn my hand over uh, the veins are in a different place. They're, they're on my wrist. You know, you see the veins. So you'll see the veins in the wrist, but you don't see the veins in your hand because you're looking through a thick, frosted, uh, scattering medium. And so experiments that Glenn has done actually show that you can shine infrared light on your back and it'll come out through your chest. So it gets through your lungs, through your, around your heart, probably doesn't get through your heart, just around your heart. So it gets deep into the body. So this infrared light can access almost the whole body. Now, there's a very close analogy here with the plants. And you know, one of my themes here is there's a, such a close interplay between the different life forms on the planet. And when we're talking about light, the plants and the animals work in concert and they, they, they share resources without being uh, disruptive. Now the top spectrum, again, this is a spectrum. It's fairly obvious, it's color and brightness. Uh, you can see the colors easy enough. This is looking out of my study window and this is looking at the blue sky. I've removed a lot of the details of the sun solar spectrum and so on, so it looks easy, easier to look at, but it's in energy terms, it's right. So that's looking at a blue sky. Now I switch to the, the other window in my study, which looks at an olive tree, which is in sunlight outside the window. And you see the olive tree absorbs most of the visible. I said photosynthesis works in the visible, so most of the visible is absorbed. But in the infrared, in the near infrared, it suddenly leaps up to incredibly high reflectivity. And so if you take infrared photographs of trees in sunlight, the leaves look so bright that they're brighter than the uh, white clouds in the sky. They're incredibly reflective. In fact, they're so reflective, it's very hard to understand how they do it. It's a very subtle process. But you see this peak here goes higher than the peak in the daylight. So I'm getting more infrared light from the tree than I am from the sky. So trees are wonderful things to have outside your windows because if they if they see the sun and they shine their, shine through the windows, uh, you get lots of infrared. And the best place you can sit in the whole universe is under a tree in sunlight. Newton and the apple. Why did Newton discover gravity? Because he was sitting under a tree and his brain was working. <laughs> so if we, uh, I can show you my olive tree. Uh, this is in the visible image on the left where we have pigments, so it's dark and green. Uh, actually, chlorophyll, I mean, uh, the trees are brilliant red, of course, but we can't see them because it's a bit redder than we can see. But you can see the brilliance of the, of the leaf reflections. 
and I, I actually I measured one. Uh, I think it was this morning actually, and the the reflectivity of an olive leaf is nearly ninety percent, and that's nearly as nearly as good as the best artificial white reflecting surface that you can make. It's absolutely stunning. And if you look at a, a landscape, uh, this is a landscape uh, in in the infrared at eight hundred nanometers, and you. You walk through this sunlit woodland, and you have a wall of uh, of, of brilliant near infrared radiation surrounding your body. And you're standing vertically, so all this infrared radiation radiation goes straight into your body. And um, it's even it's even more extreme than that. A lot of this radiation from the trees goes upwards; doesn't all come down to the ground. So it goes up into the sky, and a lot of it gets bounced back, either off the underside of clouds. Or indeed, it gets scattered back by Rayleigh scattering from the from the clear sky. And the next plot I show it's another spectrum uh, you can see from the uh, from the, from the visible through to the infrared. And you see these little blips here. They suddenly start going above the the red line. Uh, and this is the chlorophyll. This is the the, the trees reflecting. And this is the trees. Right. This is an overcast sky. These are the trees reflecting off the clouds down to the ground again. And almost 20% of the infrared light we get uh, when we go out in an overcast sky is not coming directly from the sky. It's coming from the trees radiating upwards and bouncing down. So it's extraordinary and, uh, uh, and not widely realized at all. Now, the next question you will ask, what's the next question you will ask? OK, you go outside and you stand in the outside. Do you have to strip your clothes off? Do you? You do. To that's to get your vitamin D, you have to have, because it happens on your skin, the light doesn't get into your skin. But actually in the infrared, um, we've lost the pigments. Remember, we've lost the pigments. And so what happens is that the scattering pro properties of clothes, your body and so on, the scattering, the scattering is very strong and the absorption is very weak. So suddenly we've changed from a regime in the visible, but the absorption is strong and the scattering is weak. Uh, to a, a regime where the scattering's scattering strong and the uh, and the absorption's weak, and that makes an enormous difference. And so I've taken a set of normal clothes uh, for you know an autumn day or something: a t-shirt, a shirt, and a woolen jumper, and I've shone light through. And um, so this is just what it looks like. This is just a that's a that's a an olive-coloured t-shirt, a blue shirt, and uh, a woolen jumper. So I put an infrared light. I've got the infrared light here. I can show you afterwards, actually. I put the infrared light behind it. Now, this is not just an infrared light. It has a red light as well, which we can see. So you can see the red light. But you can see there's a tiny bit of red light coming through, but not very much. And then I take a picture with an infrared camera instead of an ordinary visible camera. And you see the, the light is coming through. And it, almost 100 times as much light is coming through in the infrared than it is in the red here. So clothes are incredibly transparent. And similarly, your body is inc incredibly transparent in the infrared. So this transition uh, between the visible and the near infrared is really very dramatic. Uh, the you know the familiar visual concepts that we have of the way light interacts with our surroundings and all the colors and pigments and absorption and so on it completely changes in the near infrared. So you have to think in a very different way, and that's what we've just been doing over the last. Uh, months and years. The scattering dominates over absorption, I said, travel. Well, it remains in this volume in your body for much longer than it would if it just went straight through. So you're trapping it inside the body. And uh, it becomes the body, the volume becomes flooded with light, I say much brighter than the light would be actually outside before it got in, because it's delaying the light within the space. So there's plenty of time and space for photons to interact with absorbers. So how does it interact with biology? Well, we know in plants, the light's captured by the chloroplasts. Uh, the, the, you know, you, you've seen the cellular organelles that contain the antenna pigments, chlorophyll and other things. The photon energy is transferred into two what we call photosystems, which use broken water and carbon dioxide to make sugar as food. And remember that we, the oxygen is the byproduct of this process that so gets released into the atmosphere. In animals, the experimental evidence is that the red and near infrared light can penetrate tissue and reach the mitochondria. So that's the animal version of the chloroplast. 
the organelles that, with the help of oxygen, convert food to the cellular energy currency called adenine, adenosine tr triphosphate, A ATP, which you all can probably come across ATP. It's a quite common uh, word to use. And the current thinking is that the absorbed photons both increase the efficiency of oxygenic, oxygenic respiration, speeding up the ATP synthesis, making it work better, and controlling the levels of what we call reactive oxygen species. These are, these are oxygen atoms and molecules that are especially reactive, and they can be very dangerous inside cells. They're like hand grenades you can throw into cells. They react with anything they come across, and they often do damage. But having said that, they're actually very important markers for biology, so they have a, a real function as well, but they have to be controlled. And it seems that the infrared light plays a role in controlling these, uh, these reactive oxygen species. And um, so they allow the mitochondria to work hard, generating energy for us. And in fact, you could almost consider the, if you, if you considered the mitochondrion to be an engine uh, that you were driving along, uh, if you didn't feed this en en engine with, with oil or, uh, or you didn't cool it, it wouldn't work very well. It would work perhaps very slowly, but it wouldn't work very well. So the two processes we are considering here could be a combination of lubricating the, 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 the process of respiration, uh, making the electron transport chain, which makes the electric voltage, which makes the ATP, uh, lubricate and, and cooling the mitochondrial engine, that is getting rid of the reactive oxygen species. And I, I won't dwell, I've got drawings of the, I won't dwell on this because we've already talked about uh, the, 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 the mitochondria and the, and the chloroplast. Uh, well, just um, I mentioned blue light before at the end, I want to um, uh, let Glenn talk a little bit about the experimental evidence, what I've been talking about. I've sort of set the scene and told you what the kind of processes are that are going on. Uh, but there's a great deal of experimental evidence now to show that the near infrared light has very profound effects on, on, on life processes in, in, in many different ways. Now, I know at least some of you in the audience have been concerned about blue light for a long time, as indeed have I. I haven't mentioned blue light yet. There's also extensive evidence that blue light can have the opposite effect of red light on the mitochondrial function. It slows down the ATP production. It seems to trap the oxygen and not allow oxygen to get in the right place. And uh, so it slows down the ATP production, especially when the amount of blue light is out of balance with the light in the red. We've evolved for millions of years hundreds of millions of years without um, uh, with, with with sunlight where there are generally more infrared photons red photons than there are blue photons now suddenly we've moved into a range in white leds where it's zero so this is a problem so the, you can have an orwellian statement red light good blue light bad just bear that in mind but blue light on its own is especially bad now, here's an experimental evidence su summary, which uh, I won't talk through now. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a list of things that we have been working on over the last years, and Glenn's group has done lots of experiments. Uh, I'll let him talk to a couple of those, and I'll, I'll uh, just finish off with a summary. Just to reinforce, photosynthesis manufactures food using visible light. Near-infrared light penetrates bodies and enhances the efficiency of food usage, i.e. your metabolism. Just think what that means for a moment. If you increase the efficiency of your metabolism, you don't divert food to making fat because you can't process it quickly enough. You just almost immediately convert it into cellular energy so you can run around. So you get lots of energy. Um, as Glenn will say, it can, it can control your blood sugars. If you have red light, it allows your blood sugars to drop much more quickly. And so the effects on uh, type two diabetes can be profound. And um, the plants and animals exploit, exploit largely different regions of the solar spectrum. So the plants uh, 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 use the visible light and the animals use the near infrared path. Um, and they work closely together. In fact, the process I've described this evening can be called in a way a mirror image of photosynthesis. Motor photosynthesis takes solar photons, uses their energy to make food. And then this process I've been talking about with near infrared 
takes the oxygen from the waste product of the photosynthesis. It uses that to burn your food to make ATP, to make cellular energy. But it's not, the in this case, the photons are lubricating the process. The photons are not the source of the energy. So the, the, these photons are much lower energy. They're not making food directly, but they're helping the mitochondria burn the food to make ATP. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lubrication process, but it's absolutely in concert with the photosynthesis itself. Synthesis makes the food, uh, the infrared light process allows you to burn it into, into energy most effectively. While the sun is the dominant source of near infrared light, many people are currently exposed to very little of it. I mean, the current running average of American, the average American, it spends 93% of their time either indoors or in their car. So we don't get, uh, we don't get much infrared radiation. Children get very little infrared, infrared radiation, and that has profound effects. Hopefully Glenn will mention that. Um, light for visual, the light for vision alone, which is the LED, degrades public health. So we can have questions afterwards, but can I ask Glenn to perhaps uh, say a little bit about, uh, I have your view graphs on, on here. You and you can just stand Selected here. Selected ones. Selected ones, yes. Okay. And there's no, there are no kids in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, I want to just, just take away from Bob's talk a key issue, and that key issue is we've evolved for millions of years under balanced daylight. Now we have a situation where you're not in balanced daylight, you're being saturated with blue light, and you're getting almost no infrared light. When we were young, we had our tungsten bulbs, and they were great, but they've gone. So Bob wanders into my lab muttering, saying, we're all going to die. And at first, we took him, we ignored him. Um, I'm afraid as time's gone on, I'm moving a little bit in that direction. Now, I'm going to just take two examples of what happens if we grab hold of a group of people and we say to them, let's give you a bit more infrared light and let's see what happens to your systemic physiology. Okay, let's take you back to just for a few minutes to wandering through Africa with no clothes on and getting loads and loads of sunlight. Now, my subject population are people I drag from the corridor. They're all largely older individuals, I think largely like ourselves. Now, ourselves, our mitochondria are in very poor condition. We're supposed to live until we're about 40, right? We're well over that now. And our mitochondria are really beaten up and vulnerable. And we're making them 10 times worse by sitting under, I don't know what the spectrum of this light is, but probably much, much worse by putting them under blue light. So two examples that are critical for us in an aging population. In an aging population, we're losing control of blood sugars. And the consequence of that is a higher increase in diabetes. And that is a big public health issue, very big public health issue. And it's very, very profound in societies that don't go out at all. So um, Arabic societies, where it's really, really hot. A lot of the time you spend behind glass, and because some of those societies have a lot of money, that glass blocks infrared. You rush to your car, you drive off. So very much as Bob, Bob described. So what we've got here is just one of, you've really got to drag people in for this experiment. It's horrible. It's a blood glucose tolerance test. And what we do is we ask you to drink a horrendous cup of almost pure sugar. And then after we've done that, we're going to look at your blood sugars and we're going to stick needles in your fingers and we're going to take blood samples. We're going to measure, measure your blood sugars just to make sure we've got things right. We're going to stick a tube up your nose so we measure your CO2 because as you burn glucose, you produce more CO2. Now, our mitochondria are desperately dependent on glucose. They need glucose and they need oxygen to survive. So, I'm, unfortunately, I should have presented this in two slides because you've already got the punchline to some extent. So, if we look at the blood glucose levels in 
people here that we've just dragged in off the corridor. We look at the green curve at the top. And after we've given this horrible glucose drink, their blood glucose levels peak after around 40 to 60 minutes. This is really not great peaking. You, when you suffer from diabetes, it's not having high blood glucose that's a problem. The real problem is it peaking up and down. So you really want to stop those peaks when you've eaten three slices of bread with peanut butter on it. The red line is the individuals that have had a burst of red light for 15 minutes on their backs, only 800 square centimeters, like that. And you can see their blood glucose levels don't peak. Now, if I talk to your mitochondria in one part of your body, if I expose them to red light, they instantly start talking to mitochondria in other parts of your body. And in actual fact, signaling molecules in your blood change like crazy very, very quickly afterwards. So a very small amount of red light, in this case, 15 minutes of 670 nanometer light, which you can see, quite deep red, and we've started to control our blood sugars. And have we got the right story? Yeah, we've got the right story because in the lower graph, our CO2 production is peaking. So we know our mitochondria are burning that glucose. My mitochondria burn most of the glucose in your body. Mitochondria are hot. They burn, they, people argue about what temperature they run at. Some people think about 48. Some people have argued 50. They're the reason we get hot when we run down the road. So we can control blood sugars with red light by making our mitochondria work harder. And our mitochondria were working harder when we we're in the savannah in Africa than they are when we're sitting in our front room under our great LED lights. That's the first example. The second example probably is a little bit more of a, a catch. Now, there's a great thing called the mitochondrial theory of aging. Mitochondria actually have got enormous powers over your body. They control inflammation. We know now they control your blood sugars. The mitochondria can wake up one day and they can say time to die mm -hmm. and they can kill you. And that happens because they start producing more reactive oxygen species um, and they can have quite a profound effect on you. But I work at the Institute of Ophthalmology, so there's a moral obligation to do something with vision occasionally. So occasionally. Um, I should also point out we did a lot of this red light work initially on bees and I was buying in bumblebee hives and treating them with red light. And uh, that's caused some consternation. But bumblebees under red light live longer. Flies under red light live longer. Can't do it with mice. It's too expensive. But what if we ask ourselves the question, can I improve your vision with red light? Because there's more mitochondria in your retina than any other part of your body in each cell. And your retina burns more energy than any other organ in your body per unit volume. It, and it's doing that because it's trying to adjust to these incredible changes in luminance. It's turning the, the amplifier up and down, up and down, um, as you change the luminance levels in different rooms you walk through. So we take a group of individuals, and the age is along the bottom. Just look at the top curve there. And you can see in every situation we've got paired figures. We've got a black one, and we've got a red one, and they're thresholds. OK, thresholds are good when they go down. OK, so what we're doing here is we're sticking people in a room and we're showing them letters in a very kind of quite a very, very high resolution monitor. And we're changing the contrast of the letters. So I'm going to make it really hard for you, really hard. Can you see that letter A? I'm putting a load of noise into the system. And sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. The interesting thing here is every individual that we tested here is a black dot. We gave them three minutes of red light, which was to the eye, and we brought them back later. The red square is their threshold for color vision after they've had the red light. Their thresholds go down. Their color vision improves 
We've got two sets of graphs here. Top one is for blues, bottom one's for reds. Your blue vision is really vulnerable, incredibly vulnerable. Um, it gets worse as you, much worse when you get old. It gets worse in diabetes. It gets worse in macular degeneration. We all say you shouldn't see blue. So what we've got with the blue here is by giving a short burst of red light that you're not getting in your normal environment. Across that population, we've improved your threshold by 17%. Now that burst of red light, which was three minutes, lasts for five days. Five days later, bang, you go off the edge of the cliff and you're back to where you were before. And that's the same if you're a bumblebee, a mouse, a human, whatever. It's highly, highly conserved. Uh, the lower one C here is your perception of your color contrast in the red domain. And I can't shift that quite as much because reds are not as vulnerable as blues. But in every case, we actually find we can improve the uh, perception, the red color contrast, in this case, by 12%. So we're improving your color contrast for red and for blue. And in both cases, it lasts five days. And there's enormous variability between people. Some people I can improve by 3%. Some people I can improve by 25%. And I've asked them every question on the planet. What time do you get up? What do you eat? Eating's important. Do you take physical exercise? How much do you drink? I still can't find out what the difference is. But does it matter? Probably not. I'm giving you back part of the red light that is naturally in the environment. I'm improving your mitochondrial function, and we're taking it up to whole organism physiology. Now, this kind of thing, and particularly in the central nervous system where mitochondria are very, very running at high temperatures, high pressures, it's quite easy to demonstrate. But in brain damage, um, you get a similar situation where red light can improve the prognosis. Um, lots of work on Parkinson's disease, which again is a neurodegenerative disease that kicks off with mitochondria going wrong. So how we could improve our environment if we change the light bulbs? This is where Bob and I agree. And now we work mainly with architects because we've got wall panels. And instead of using 670, we use 850. You can't see 850. You walk past it, and there's a little bit of a glow you can feel. But by putting those wall panels in, we're actually able to not only improve your color vision, but also control your blood sugars. So we need those in nursing homes. We need those in critical care units. We need those in places where your mitochondria are taking a beating. And I think we've, I think we've done that. We just haven't got people to fork out the money to go into production. But um, so Bob's absolutely right. We're missing a big part of environmental light. And that's the effect that it's having at the end of the day. Thank you. So, questions for anyone? All right, we'll start off with questions in the room. And then we'll can you get the mic if you could hold it up like this because it's very directional um, i'll start off with the front and you pass it on. thank you very much bob um in one of your early slides you had a tungsten bulb and you showed the spectrum and just how much infrared and you also showed an led with almost no uh no range and infrared and i assume that's purely by design i mean we're just not designing leds that emit that uh you know those long haul wavelengths there's no in principle reason why we shouldn't do that i assume uh, there is no reason in principle why we can't do that i mean the reason it's not done is because lights were involved were, were developed for vision and of course you know you can't see the infrared so there's no if you added an infrared component into the light in whatever way, uh, you would increase public health probably by a very large factor, and you would spend a little bit more money in running, running your lighting. But if you looked, I'm sure if you looked numerically at that ratio of decreased expenditure versus increased expenditure, you'd find it's very much in favor 
putting infrared light in. In fact, um, there have been thoughts about um, the kind of uh, uh, lighting that you might that you might develop. And this is actually a, a light bulb. It looks like just a very conventional light bulb. It has an LED in there, which is very much like the LED that I that I plotted there. Uh, but it also has, and this is really quite clever, instead of having a, a red LED, which apparently red LEDs are not quite so efficient as the, the blue ones, and a little bit more difficult and expensive to make. But what this bulb contains is an old tungsten filament, a small one, but it's run at very low temperature. And so it creates very little heat. You can, you know, I can run this bulb for a long time and put my hand on it without a difficulty. Uh, so it doesn't emit any visible light, which is where all the energy goes into. In order to make tungsten to emit uh, visible light, you have to write very hot. And that's why the lights are such a waste of energy because they radiate all of their energy in the, almost all of their energy in the infrared. This bulb radiates its energy through the near infrared. Uh, it runs at about the temperature of a candle and um, it fills in the gaps. So this is a possible solution to that. It's a little bit more complicated than a uh, than a real just an LED bulb, but not very much. So there are ways of doing this, and you know we're we're not going to invent the new lighting. The lighting engineers are going to do that, and I'm sure there are many clever ways they can do that. But they need direction to do that, either by regulation or by being um, realizing that they're damaging people's health and they want to avoid damaging people's health. So you know there are ways of doing this. I think quite easily, but. Uh, Um, my understanding of mitochondria is generously put at hazy, <laughs> but I understand way back living cells incorporated mitochondria from bacteria, um, where they clearly performed the sort of functions that they now do maybe other functions. Where where does this apply way back when, when that was the case? And it, was that the reason that living cells generally have mitochondria? Well, my understanding, I'm not a biologist, but my I'm going to talk to Stuart on Monday about all this, but <laughs> my understanding is that the both the mitochondrion and the chloroplast were derivatives of the original eukaryotic cell. That absorbed an organelle uh, uh, of, a, of a, uh, an, an elementary bacterium and they evolved in somewhat different ways but of course plants have mitochondria as well I mean they have chloroplast but they also have, they have to build their own bodies so they have mitochondria and uh, as, as well so this has been going on uh, since the first eukaryotic cell uh, which is you know of order three billion years or so ago and uh, you know these various adaptations. In fact, you know, I would argue that the chloroplast and the mitochondrion have developed in concert because they they perform different parts of the same process. You know, you might add these two processes, it's a more general process of the uh, utilization of, of solar photons by life. You have the production phase and the and the usage phase in, in, in this. So Yes, we're not. I mean, we're not discovering. We're not discovering anything new here. All this has been going on for billions of years, but um, we're just beginning to see what's what's actually happening and how vital the various parts are. And I think, you know, the question about light pollution. Uh, the issue with light pollution is that, um, you know, all, all the things that were spoken about by uh, Steve Tonkin in the last talk were to do with security and driving and people getting around safely at night and so on. Uh, and he demonstrated quite clearly, I think, that brilliantly bright lights everywhere don't actually do any good for that. So when we're shining, we're shining bright white lights on something like 20, more than 20% of the Earth's surface every night now. And that light is worse than useless. It's, it's, not, it's damaging life and it's not necessarily increasing security. So there's a whole problem of using too much light. It's absolutely the wrong light because all the insects and so on that come out at night see this blue light without any red light and they die. We know they die. If you, if you, if you keep fruit flies under blue light, they, they live half as long. If you put fruit flies under red light, under infrared light, they live longer. 
um, it's very clear that the evidence is, you know, compelling. It's absolutely compelling. So it, it's become very clear to us that we are doing absolutely the wrong thing. The white LED, I could show you, I've got my meter here. I can, the last talk I gave, I actually measured it and handed it round. You can see what you're, you're getting. We're getting no infrared at all. And we can't keep on like this. We're just beginning to see the beginnings of the deleterious effects of the lighting that we developed but over 10 years ago, it's going to get much worse. I mean, we didn't talk about myopia. Myopia, Glenn is very concerned with this at the moment. Children are getting myopia much more now than they were uh, in previous decades, much more. And the reason is they're not getting any infrared light. They're not going outside enough. And they're looking at screens all the time. They're, they're seeing blue screens with no infrared at all. And, you know, this has devastating consequences when they grow up because you know myopia when you're young will lead to all kinds of I understand all kinds of complications as you get older so these are really really serious issues for public health and if we think you know if we think of having a proper public health system rather than just having a public sickness system which we have at the moment there are many things you have to do we know all about ultra processed foods and so on making you fat and so on but the red light is a kind of overarching contributor to this uh, to this to this to the solution to this problem you know we have the problem we're seeing the effects one of the possibly the most important solution is to change the way we light ourselves either by behavior or by changing indoor lighting well that was my question bob um great talk um and you pointed out a huge issue uh, that has you know, implications for our health how do you get from your having the idea and doing some research to actually impacting on public policy and and you know changing the way we all live well that's, I mean, it, it is a good question it's a question that occupies us greatly and uh, there's some very fundamental things here is that um you know, scientists write papers, uh, get them refereed, and if they're lucky, get them published, and then 50 people read them, um, read the papers. Um, we have to reach out to the public, I think, with this problem. Glenn and I have discussed this at great length. We need to reach out, and we, who are the important people we need to talk to? I mean, we, we've already decided that architects are, architects and lighting engineers are important, and we have open conversations with these people, and they're very receptive. Uh, medics are a bit of a problem. Uh, they got to, they're too busy uh, to think about these things. Most medics know nothing about this at all. Um, my GP has never heard of red light therapies and so on. Um, you know, people have heard of red light therapies for wound healing and so on, and all that works. I'm a living example of this. I, I have to say, I broke my femur a little over two months ago, and uh, I mean, you might notice that I have a bit, but you know, I had a huge operation. I had a slit in my knee to my hip, and that main muscle was cut right through. So I've gone through an amazing healing process over the last two months. And when I went to see my surgeon in the hospital after six, after whatever it was, two months, I thought, yeah, two months after afterwards, I saw him. And, you know, he looked at the wound, he said, it looks fine, and so on. And he said, how are you getting home? And I said, I'm walking home. He said, you're what? And I said, well, I'm walking 7,000 steps a day. And he sat down at this point. He said, I've got plenty of time. Tell me what's going on. And um, I said, well, I had an exercise sheet. And it said, the first thing I should do is put an ice pack on my on my wood. I said, I didn't do that. I put an 850 nanometer lamp on my wood for 15 minutes every morning. And so I've been doing that for every morning. And he was absolutely stopped. He said, if we could get elderly patients, it wasn't. <laughs> if we could get the, the really elderly patients, uh, healed more quickly, we would save all these hospital beds and so on. And they had people in, in hospital for weeks and weeks after after these operations with no hope of really getting them walking again. So, you know, it really does work. And, uh, you know, this is, <laughs> we had we had problem with snake oil in the beginning. I mean, everybody, all the medics said, oh, red light, snake oil, you know, you can't convince us of that. Uh, but, you know, we, we are now, after a number of years working on this, we're convinced that we're dealing with something, some very fundamental process, which we have to deal with if we're going to have a healthy population. And, you know, the insects, insects, the insect collapse is to some extent due to the red light problem, the lack of red light and the presence of blue light. You know, there are insecticides and all the other things as well. But... 
Um, I put well, I probably have a then I probably have a picture of a mitochondrion in your size. Let me, uh, I, yeah, well, that's a picture of a mitochondrion, it's probably not the best one. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. Uh, I'm not a biologist, but I'll have a go. Glenn can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the, the process that happens in, in a mitochondrion is a process which um, generates electrical generates a voltage across a membrane. It has a membrane and it tries to push protons across the membrane. In order to do that, it needs energy. It gets energy by burning food with oxygen. So the food comes in and it gets oxidized by oxygen and it drives electrons step by step uh, up a voltage gradient until the final step uh, when it has enough energy to push a proton through the membrane on the other side. And then you get a voltage and the, the voltage gradient in that voltage between the proton on one side and the inner membrane on the other side is about the same as the voltage gradient in a lightning strike. It's over, I mean, in terms of volts per, per centimeter, it's a very strong voltage gradient. And it's that voltage gradient that drives uh, 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 an enzyme called ATP synthase, which is like a little rotor. It has, a, it has an axle sticking through the membrane. And the, uh, the, the, when the proton comes in, it drives the rotor around, it rotates and gradually assembles the ATP and gives it to the cell. So it's an engine. It's an engine that takes energy from, it doesn't have petrol, it has food, comes in, it oxidizes the food, that's the way you oxidize the engine in your car. And then it, the engine is what's called the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain has four elements, uh, which gradually move the electrons uh, to different energy states and then finally push them over the edge and you use that battery then a battery uh, to drive the little motor to make the ATP okay applause is appreciated for that because I <laughs> <laughs> um hi thank you both um I'm over here hi <laughs> Um, I have one consideration and a question. And the first one was the Japanese have um, forest bathing. And after what you said about the leaves and the beautiful picture, I wonder if, you know, there is the science behind that thought. We are now realizing you mentioned, you know, the leaves give us all that light. Do you want me to ask? Let me answer that one first. Yes. Otherwise, I'll forget it. I'll forget it. After. Yeah, I just, I, actually, I just heard my wife found an article about forest bathing the other day and we, we talked about this and they have many reasons for doing this they don't mention explicitly this reason but it is true actually it's a, you know the forest understory where all these little, little animals live they live in you know in a, in a dense canopy they're living almost in darkness and yet they thrive under this canopy and the reason they do that is i told you about the, the reflectivity of leaves and the the fact that uh, the leaves are extremely bright the sunshine shining on the leaves radiates this infrared down under the canopy. And these animals are as happy as pigs in whatever. Um, uh, so the forest bathing for humans, and I know long before I started working on this, whenever I visited an arboretum, I would stand in the middle of the arboretum and I would feel perfectly content, more content than I could ever feel anywhere else. I was very conscious of this. And I'm sure many people have felt the same things. If they walk through a wood and they take shade under a tree, uh, they feel wonderful. And that, you know, that's not unrelated to the story I've been telling you. It is a very, very nice place to be. And, uh, you know, we, we're telling the architects, if you put trees outside windows, uh, if, you, if you arrange it so the trees are at some point, part of the day, illuminated by sunlight, and the sunlight is allowed to shine into the windows and you don't have infrared absorbing glass in those windows, it will bathe you in infrared light. So it's a way of getting useful non-LED light into buildings that can have a very positive effect. And you can think of many cases where being amongst vegetation, I mean, I showed you the picture of the little stream and the, and the trees, you know, huge amounts of infrared radiation coming from those trees, all going through your clothes into your, into your body. So yes, forest bathing is a great idea, fantastic. And um, the 
question was, um, I, I work with my computer or my phone all the time. Is there an easy? Yes. Yes. Excuse me. Um, I use my telephone and my computer all the time. Um, are there easy fixes to reducing the light, the blue light coming off them or turning them into a, a red light? Um. Well, the, qu the question was, if you're sitting down looking at your computer and uh, looking at your, computer, your, your phone all the time, is there anything you can do to alleviate the, the damage that's being done by that? Well, the first one is get outside more often. Every, every half an hour, get up and go outside. Um, you can get infrared lamps. I mean, we don't generally recommend infrared lamps to people, but you can get infrared lamps. In fact, we use them. My wife and I use them in the house all the time. But Whenever we wake up in the morning, we switch an infrared light that shines onto the ceiling and bathes us in, in, in infrared light for you know, 20 minutes or so before we, before we get up. So there are strategies for doing that. But you know, it is true that if you only look at, if you, if you sit under a, a white LED in your room all day and you look at a computer screen on your phone and you don't do anything else. And I do worry about you know, certain, I imagine your nurses are on night shift you know, they drive in their car, uh, they go to hospital, they're in the hospital all day long, all night long, and uh, they're under white LEDs all the time. They drive home and they go to bed, so they don't see any sunlight at all. This is a recipe for ill health, general ill health. In fact, I think the best analogy I can think of, who's, who's heard of the wood wide web? Okay, the, my, the mycorrhizal network under, <laughs> under the trees, holding all the trees together. In a sense, the, the, the starvation of infrared light that we're getting now in, indoors is like going around and sniffing all these mycorrhizal uh, filaments that connect the trees together. The trees will still live, live but they'll be sickly and they won't grow well. So, you know, it's, I, I think it's a fairly close analogy. So, Can I, uh, follow up on that? Well, the um, Dell. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Dell uh contacted us about changing their screens so we reduce the blue and we introduce longer wavelengths and that went quite a long way their screen uh engineers had modified screens to do that um but before dell can market anything they had to put it through sales sales killed it dead because it was going to add x percentage to the cost of the screen and it was going to make them uncompetitive uh, red screens, unfortunately, do absorb a lot more energy, but um, the industry is aware of it, or a lot of the industry is aware of it, but it's not moving anywhere. And uh, not long after we were talking about this, because Bob had told me a story about his wound healing, my cousin, who's 70, cut her leg two months ago, and it's not healing. So two times a week, she goes along to the local uh, GP. They take the dressings off, clean it all up, put the dressings back on, and it's just going on and on. And they're saying, we'll have to go and send you to a wound specialist, um, and uh, you, you, this is going to ulcerate. And I'm thinking maybe we're going completely the wrong way about wound healing. Take the bandages off, shine red light. Just wonder what you thought. Give the microphone to Glenn. It's easy. Uh, the, the, first, the first time this whole issue surfaced were NASA engineers growing plants under red light. I don't know why they were doing it. I'm not a biologist. But they noticed that the nicks and cuts on their hands were healing a lot quicker. And they didn't have an explanation. It's published. They didn't have an explanation for it. It's one of those little bits of that's coming. The use of red light for diabetic ulcers is just beginning to creep in in big diabetic hospitals and and look, it, it costs nothing it's unbelievably safe egg on your face if it doesn't work but uh look it's really worth it i think just closing a wound in with bandages sealing it in. exactly nice with all the problems atmosphere, lots of folks sitting around oh this is a nice place to be yeah mike yeah. it's a no-brainer yeah this, uh, this is what we use, uh, well, one of the ones we use. This is a, a mixed red light and infrared light. So half the, half the LEDs in here are 660 nanometers. You can see very clearly 
the other ones are 850, which you can't see at all. Um, 29 quid on Amazon. Plug it into an ordinary light fitting, you know, E27 light fitting, and shine it on the wall. The walls are very transparent, they're very uh, reflective. Shine it on, don't look it into, into, into it directly, uh, but shine it on the wall and live around it for a while. And as Len says, you don't need very much. I mean, we the, the kind of um, energy densities on, on a surface that we're using uh, for the for the therapies are really quite low. I mean, they're, they're uh, you know, sometimes lower than sunlight, direct Great. sunlight. Shouldn't I tell you just three minutes? Okay, um, we're, we're actually approaching nine o'clock, and this is really interesting. We've got a load of questions in the chat channel, and I've only got through half the room. Um, so for, I think I'd like to ask you, are you willing to carry on? Sure. Um, in that case, um, if anyone feels they have to leave, feel free to do so, because uh, normally nine o'clock is the end, but we'll, we'll carry on until we're thrown out by the Brilsey staff. Do you want to do some of the chat channel? Or, or... Um, yes, we, we could. Well, there was a question here that's been waiting for a long time. Let's deal with you first. Um, it's just on a practical level. Talk it's, horizontal. Um, it's just on a, on a practical level, in terms of us going out, going for a walk, being in nature, and you See. you showed photographs of you uh, the light going through clothes, so wearing a t-shirt, a shirt and a jumper. Is there any difference between wearing uh, clothes in natural fibres, like cotton and wool, or synthetic, so some fleeces and outdoor gear? It's, a, it's um, obviously synthetic material. So does it matter whether we're wearing natural fibers or synthetic? And the other thing is, does it make any difference as to what colors we're wearing in terms of absorption? Okay. I'm not a scientist. Um, yes, but... I, 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 I will answer that as best I can. I think um, the, the, the natural fibers have evolved to allow this kind of thing to happen. The unnatural, the, 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 the artificial fibers have not necessarily done so, uh, but it's not necessarily true that they won't do the same thing. In fact, the, uh, the picture that I showed of my clothing, that was actually a, it was a, it was a t-shirt that was olive green and that olive green pigment does not appear in the infrared at all. It's as good as white in the infrared. There are some pigments, some black pigments that actually do absorb, but they're relatively unusual. Most pigments don't absorb in the infrared. So it, to, to first order anyway, it doesn't matter what color it is, but it'll, the light will get through. Um, I suspect there are some artificial fibers that might absorb, but generally plastics and so on don't absorb strongly at that wavelength. They, they absorb at slightly longer infrared wavelengths. Um, but that window is relatively clear for most substance, I mean, I observe all, I have spectrometers at home. I observe all everything at these right. different wavelengths. And I, I've seen what most things are like. And it's remarkable how, um, how, uh, how transparent they are or how reflective they are. Is, um, it, is it generally best to wear natural fabrics? Or, or is it your, well, I'll say my, my, my jumper is an alpaca jumper and it's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, probably probably safer. But I, I can't advertise for, for all uh, natural fibers. Probably, probably under most circumstances, it probably doesn't make that much difference. But natural fibers, I know, I've observed, they're often they are very transparent in the infrared. Um, in a that's a. I mean, it's a it's a kind of very. Difficult question to answer, not because of nature and so on, but if nature gets too much ultraviolet uh, and too much blue light because they don't wear any clothes, that can be very damaging. In fact, the, the sunblock that you wear to block ultraviolet doesn't really protect you against skin cancer at all. Um, in fact, there's a lot of evidence now that people who spend more time in the sun have less skin, skin cancer than the people who occasionally go out with sunblock on them. And that's because the, 
the blue light, which does the gets deeper into your into your skin, it gets into the fat layer below the skin, and that's where the cancer um, gets generated. And so it's the blue light that is the danger. And the best way of avoiding blue light is to use clothing, which is you know has a reasonable protection against blue light. Um, as far as the red light's concerned, uh, it probably doesn't make much difference, I said, because you know the clothes are transparent anyway. So I think the naturists have to be careful not to overexpose themselves in sunlight. I think I've probably answered that as best I can. It's not a straightforward answer, but so. Okay, thank you very much for, your, for both of your talks. Very interesting. I just had a question. Uh, your colleague uh, discussed the longevity of the effect of the infrared uh, when it came to the uh, vision uh, side of things. I just wondered whether uh, there was also a similarly long uh, uh, effect in terms of the glucose experiments. You showed over the period uh, about was it two hours or so, uh, the effect on the glucose levels. Uh, but would there be an effect beyond that two hours? Or do you have to irradiate again uh, with infrared to get the same effect? Hand the microphone to Glenn, please. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, you try getting people to do these experiments. You're just not popular. Um, so I generally don't know. Um, I am minded to believe that there is this highly conserved mechanism which lasts five days, right? five and a half days. I'm minded to believe that the protective effects of red light on blood glucose will similarly follow that pattern, but I don't know. Would, would you like to be a subject? You know, Do you want to be bled regularly? <laughs> <laughs> Right, Ray. Uh, I think we're going to have to go to the chat channel and see what's on there. I know that one of the questions has just been answered. That was about sunblock, so we can uh, skip that. Oh, there's a lot of questions here. So that we've Actually, the question was, do sunscreens block uh, near-infrared light? No, I think not. Yeah, no. I haven't checked it, but I think not. It'd be very clever if they did, actually. It's very hard to get things to block infrared light. Um, I'm trying to understand Dipali's question. She says, glass permits ultraviolet into the house, but prevents infrared from radiating. So the house gets progressively warmer. Is this helpful for health? I'm sorry, oh. can I? Uh, <coughs> it's Dipali here. Um, well, we haven't <coughs> really I, I got think... much time, Dipali. We've gone over. Um, I think, sorry, I'm just I, I think uh, it's clarifying been covered my because question. Bob has... Can I clarify the question, talk... please? Uh, Bob has talked about... Uh, trees outside a building and uh can i let, let, i I, th I think i heard the question and i'm not quite sure but i i think the, the i mean the point about getting light into buildings or keeping light out of buildings uh you you want to keep ultraviolet light out of buildings because ultraviolet light damages people and it damages stuff in your house as well and you know it's quite damaging i say it breaks chemical bonds and so on um, infrared light, it, it's difficult to avoid having to reject infrared light from large buildings. If you build a skyscraper, which is glazed entirely with glass, you have to use infrared reflecting glass uh, to avoid uh, dramatic overheating of the building. So it's unavoidable. But if you talk to architects, they will find places where they can, where you don't get direct sunlight through uh, windows, and uh, that will uh, help you get infrared into the into into the building. Thank but, you, Bob. My question okay. is: Is it good for health to have the infrared trapped in the house because the glass doesn't allow infrared to escape back outside? So the ultraviolet comes in and stays as infrared within the property. We couldn't hear that. Can you? The glass <clears throat> acts as a one-way. Um, um, 
one yes, way. Yes, it's it's very good to have the infrared in the house. Yes, that's what you want. Okay. Right. And it doesn't okay. it, it it won't heat the house very much. If you get it from the trees outside the window, um, it will not heat the room very much, but it will be very effective for biochemistry of your body. Okay, thank you. And then we have what practical measures can people increase their near infrared exposure? Well, I, I think I kind of covered that. I mean, oh, I get outside. So. <laughs> get um, outside and, and don't wear very thick clothes, but don't worry about your clothes too much. Get outside, get in the sunlight. It doesn't have to be direct sunlight. It can be an overcast sky or whatever, but get outside mm. because you get nothing in your house. And we have a question about what kind of red light bulb, but you covered that. You described that um, light yes. bulb with a small I mean, tungsten uh, filament. We don't need to get a tungsten filament anymore. I mean, I, I'm not advocating the use of tungsten filament light bulbs in general. I mean, the little bulb I, I showed some people earlier is interesting because it doesn't use very much energy uh, and it doesn't get very hot. But... Uh, I mean, I think there are other ways of getting infrared light. I mean, uh, non-thermal ways, uh, LED ways of getting infrared light. And the, the lamps we use in experiments are easy to come by. I mean, they're not expensive. Um, and then uh, Julian Sternberg says, I have an, an infrared lamp at home, which is for back pain or joint problems. Are you proposing that I should sign this, shine this light on myself for three minutes every five days for the benefit of my metabolism. Uh, you can't get, easily get these lamps here. This came from Germany. I, I, I think, yes, I, I don't advocate it, but listen to the talk. The answer is obvious. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Right, and th then there's a question. Um, in the past, you mentioned that flight in dinosaurs developed as a response to sunlight. I can't remember you saying that, but is that something you remember? It's a story I, I remember being associated with it. This is the story about the um, the pterosaur, the um, the pterosaur, and this is a story that was being told by an old friend and colleague of mine, who's professor was professor of astronomy in Cardiff. And he thought that pterosaurs were solar powered. And I think, in fact, he wasn't terribly wrong. He was right. ridiculed. But in fact, the pterosaurs would have had um, wings with blood supplies. The sun would have shone on the blood uh, and would have made the energy production process in the pterosaur work much more efficiently. So it's not an entirely uh, stupid idea. but <laughs> oh, so That's really interesting. <laughs> um... Pterosaurs shouldn't be able to fly. They're too heavy to take off. They can't take off. And so this is a big dilemma. How did the big pterosaur, the 30, you know, the, the, the 10 meter pterosaurs, how did they ever get into the air? And uh, it's a problem that hasn't been solved. Um, what about uh, uh, the type of infrared bulbs that pet shops sell for lizards and so on? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I will. I will say something about this. is a This is a very interesting thing. Um, mm -hmm. Reptiles. Uh, if you buy a reptile and try and keep it at home, you have to give it ultraviolet light, I've, and that's because they need their vitamin D. They need an ultraviolet light. So I've got reptile bulbs at home. It's the only way I can easily buy UV UV bulbs. So a reptile will have an ultraviolet light. Now, Glenn and I have been discussing this idea that. When a reptile comes out in the morning and basks in the sun, it's always assumed that it's basking in the sun because it wants warmth. We think it basks in the sun because it wants its mitochondria to start working properly. And uh, we could experiment, we could do this experiment, but licensing for doing experiments is so difficult that none of it, nobody has a license that we know. So we can't actually do the experiment. We are talking to the Americans about this though where people do experiments on lizards. But I think the reptiles are a very interesting case. And I also ha had a, an idea, which I did discuss with um, uh, with people in Cambridge a couple of years ago. And that is before the dinosaurs uh, in, the, in the Permian, uh, there were these huge sailback animals. 
they were pre-dinosaurs, uh, but they, you, you remember the, 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 I can't remember the names now, uh, but the huge sailbacks, they had there's huge spines and extensive areas of flesh or, or skin on their backs. And I thought at the time, this may be to collect ultraviolet light to give them vitamin D, which they need to grow their huge skeletons. And it's always, again, th thought that these sailbacks are for thermal regulation, but it doesn't work. The dinosaurs are too big. It doesn't work quickly enough for that. So I think these sailbacks in the, in the Permian were because there were lots of volcanoes and so on. They weren't getting terribly much sunlight. They needed a huge collector of infrared light to work efficiently. But that's a crazy theory. But uh, I mean, it's not so silly, but it's crazy. And I have discussed it in serious scientific circles. Uh, is poor lighting going to be the new unclean air that we need to uh, structurally fix but because of politics won't be done for years? Yeah, it's the new asbestos. LEDs mm. are the new asbestos. Mm. White that... LEDs, I have to say. Not red ones, light uh, ones. <laughs> somebody asked, does anyone, use, does anyone use a red light machine? I'm not quite sure I understand that. Yeah, we do. I do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> My wife does. Unwittingly, sometimes. <laughs> um, somebody suggests um, the Just One Thing program on Radio 4 uh, with uh, Dr. Mosley. Um, right. Uh, presume work being done on cfs stroke me and that'd be chronic fatigue syndrome uh, as is thought to be possibly due to mitochondrial dysfunction that's uh, that's being trialed we're doing that well people are doing it and i'm associated with it i'll be associated with it if it works anyway uh <laughs> Uh, it makes perfect sense, absolutely perfect sense. The only question is some of the people using it are in a very, very poor condition. Uh, they, uh, they're they bed-bound. They don't like lights. They, they're in very, very poor condition. I don't think that it's going to be easy to redeem people in a very severe condition. I'm very strongly minded to believe it's going to work in those that have mild ME. Right. Uh, this is a good Question, Bob, can anyone, can you have too much NIR? Hmm. Can you have too much, can you have too much NIR? Uh, I, my, my understanding is that if you, if you want therapeutic effects of NIR, uh, you get them quite quickly. <laughs> it switches on the effect. And I think I understand from Glenn, I think that if you, shine it on you for too long, then you don't get any, you don't certainly you don't get any further benefit. But if you go, if you go over an hour, everything starts to go soggy. And we have no idea why. <laughs> so three minutes will give you a certain percentage effect. That same percentage effect is obtained at 15 minutes, 30 minutes, you're just wasting your time. Mm. But I think it might be a case of overcharging the battery. That if you actually have it on for too long, um, then um, it just goes soggy. The other thing that's desperately important is you need to do it at the right time of day. It only works in the mornings. It doesn't work any other time of day. Your mitochondria in the mornings are very, very different from your mitochondria in the afternoons. They're doing different things. Can I, can I, I'll sum, because you didn't have a microphone, I'll summarize that. Is this, yes, you can probably overexpose because everything goes soggy after about an hour. Uh, you don't need to use it so long. The effects happen quite quickly. And you have to, if you're going to use red light for therapy, uh, you have to do it in the morning yeah. uh, because of, there's, a, there's a circadian process going on and your mitochondria do all kinds of things at night uh, that they don't do during the day. And I think it seems to work best in the morning. Which can I, that brings us on to my question. I'm a medic, I'm a pediatrician. We have an epidemic of children not sleeping, particularly children with autism and ADHD. And I'm just wondering uh, your perspective, I, but either one of you on, on, on the effects of red light, you know, NIR on, on sleep and, and 
you know, and melatonin production. There's a lot claimed, but I have no experience. And one of the problems we've got at the moment is that people are making incredible claims for near infrared light without doing proper proper trials on it. So the issue of the issue of sleep comes up time and time again. I just don't know. But we do know that, for instance, red light has been used on neonates in safety trials, and it's absolutely absolutely fine it was done in australia lovely little study so again is there any harm in trying it be pragmatic yeah um we're, we're asked if uh, we're coming to an end now um will, will the talk be available uh afterwards yes the the answer is that in a month's time it'll be put on the brilsey youtube channel and i'll put a link on the um, herschel society website as well and uh uh, the last question is, uh, will extra NIR shorten the life of a mitochondria? No. So the answer is, is no. Uh, but I would like to thank um, Bob and Glenn for such an amazing talk. And uh, this is really going to take us, uh, I think, quite some time to digest. There's a lot of uh, really uh, staggering information in this. So let's... Uh, uh, applaud them in the usual way.